talk to you about mRuby and packaging applications, uh, specifically for command line applications. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, command line applications are the commands you run on the terminal when you type stuff, and uh, like, for instance, ls or grep or any of those tools there. Um, if you've ever run like Rails New, you've run a CLI app. Uh, so this is me, I'm Terrence. Uh, I go by the Twitter handle Hone02 on Twitter. Um, I'm known for wearing a blue hat. Uh, I come from the wonderful city of Austin, Texas, and I like to think we are the taco capital of the nation. And I was very excited when I found out that Denver is getting Torchy's Tacos, uh, one of my favorite taco joints. And as I've been, I've been here for, since last Saturday, and I've been hanging out with uh, people in Denver. Uh, Got to go to Turing uh, on Tuesday, which was super cool. But uh, some people who've never been to Austin uh, are quite skeptical, like, are these tacos really that good? And uh, for those of you who've never been to Austin, uh, Marty luckily has, uh, would say they're pretty amazing, and definitely when it opens, you should check them out. Um, so for instance, one of the really awesome things that Torchy's Tacos does is that they have a talk of the month. So every month they try to put something together that's pretty innovative and, and different. Uh, sometimes it's thematic, like in October they have the Scarecrow, which is this pumpkin crusted, uh, pumpkin seed crusted like chicken. Uh, this month uh, in September they have the Tipsy Chicken and uh, it's super colorful and I really want one. but. Uh, I'm in Denver, and it's not open yet. So uh, they also have really awesome queso. So if you love queso, Austin has great queso, and I'm excited that I can share this with all of you when it opens. Uh, I also run a conference called Keep Ruby Weird, which is happening in October. Uh, hopefully, I'll see some of you there. I know Zach is coming, uh, one of the organizers, so it'll be awesome to have tacos and eat barbecue. Uh, and then, uh, for those of you who did not come out to Ruby Character last night, we had a really good time. Uh, so thank you for sending that up. Um, and this is a picture of my scholar mentee, uh, Mimi, and some of her classmates uh, singing Killing Me Softly uh, on stage, which was super fun. Uh, but in addition to that, I've done this all around the world, and this is a picture of Charlie and Tom and Evo, some heroes of mine in the Ruby community who also partake, and you really get to experience a different side of people. And for those of you who have never done karaoke with Charlie Nutter, it is an experience. Uh, I think his go-to song is uh, a song by Shakira, like Hips Don't Lie, and he's really good at it. So totally recommend that experience, and it would probably be really uncool to put pictures of other people and not pictures of myself also karaoke. So this is a picture of me and PJ uh, swinging on a pole and Eurocamp uh, to totally eclipse of the heart. So uh, it's really a good time and I would recommend going to it if you've never been. Um, so there's that. And finally, I work at Heroku and I run the Ruby experience there. So if you've ever deployed a Ruby app to the platform, you're using code that I write and maintain along with Richard Schneeman. Uh, so if you are having problems or issues with that experience, then that is my fault and you should come talk to me about that uh, after my talk. Um, but I'm not here to really talk about any of that stuff. I'm here to talk about uh, building command line applications in Ruby. And I think uh, to start with that, you really have to look at what is it like to build command line applications uh, with MRI itself inside of Ruby. And um, Ruby has a lot of really great tools that make it easy to build an application. So you have stuff like Thor, which is used in Rails for uh, the Rails command. Um, there is GLI, uh, I mean, all the way back to like opparse, which is in standard lib, so you have a lot of options there. A bunch of networking libraries uh, from NetHGP all the way to like Xcon, Type Voice, et cetera. So a huge ecosystem to kind of, if you, whatever you need, like most of it has probably been built already and you can kind of focus on your business log logic and plug it all in. Um, and to kind of understand like where I'm coming from, uh, I thought I'd tell a story of the Heroku tool belt. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the tool belt, it's the command that you run on, on your terminal to create an app, to kind of just interact with Heroku, edit, uh, add add-ons, add the config bars, and uh, whatnot. And our first iteration of it was as a Ruby gem. So you run gem install Heroku, something I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, uh, with other gems like Bundler or Rails. Um, 
And back then, we were a Ruby-only company, a company built by Ruby developers for Ruby developers to kind of run Rails applications. And using a Ruby gem made a lot of sense. It kind of removed having to do a lot of extra work. We could leverage the fact that Ruby gems had a distribution system and packaging, and uh, if you've never created a gem before, it's definitely one of the easiest systems out there to kind of do that, especially with uh, bundlers, gem commands, and uh, rubygems.org being out there. And it, it just made a lot of sense to not have those, solve those problems early on for us. Um, but it didn't come without its problems. So as you know, if you're using anything with Ruby gems, you actually have to have Ruby installed, right? Like you need to have Ruby to actually run Ruby gems and actually install it and then run the actual code when you run the command itself. And the other problem was you actually have no idea as a product company when you're distributing a binary out there what version of Ruby you're running locally on your machine. And I, uh, Apple was notorious for a long time on ver older versions of OS X up until I think like 10.7, I think, for like having Ruby 1.8.7 as the system Ruby. And so that meant for us that at Heroku we actually had to regardless of Ruby 187 support by Ruby Core, we actually had to support Ruby 187 both in syntax and for support tickets because that's what uh, people were running locally on their machine. And so it was kind of a nightmare to have to deal with all these versions of Ruby and if we ever broke 18 compatibility, we would have to revert that patch and then uh, fix it and whatnot. So that wasn't a very great solution going forward, so we decided to build this thing called the Heroku tool belt and move beyond the gem. And the big difference here was it allowed us to basically bundle in a Ruby runtime with what we were distributing so we could guarantee the version of Ruby that you're running, we could build for a specific version of Ruby um, and not have to deal with those problems. But we quickly found out that packaging this up and sharing it was not very fun. Um, so I remember in the early days when we started doing this, we actually had like a Mac Mini under someone's desk that that machine's job was just to like package up the like DMG OSX client that we were using to distribute that. And then uh, there was some basically this like huge ass readme for how to do this for Windows with the special license and stuff to package all that up uh, in an exe. And every time we had to do release, we had to run through those steps. and. Um, Kind of not the best solution, but it was helpful to not have to, to be able to like target a specific version of Ruby and not have to deal with um, people not having that there. So as we moved from being a Ruby only company to supporting other languages like JavaScript or even Java and PHP, um, you can't expect people to necessarily have Ruby installed on the machine and have that all working and set up. Um, so an employee of Heroku Blake Gentry actually started on his free time this thing called HK, which was an implementation of the entire Heroku tool belt in Go. Um, he didn't implement all the features, but he kind of started with the core set of things. And one of the big motivators for that was uh, speed. So fast is a feature, uh, which is a common thing we say at the company. And so at the time, a few, like two years ago or so, when this was built, when you ran the command Heroku version, and all that actually does is read the version string in memory, print that out, and then kind of do some disk operations on your machine to check what versions of plugins you're running. Um, so it doesn't actually hit any network calls. It, that would take about 1.8 seconds when he benchmarked it um, on his machine. And then the HK vert implementation of that took 16 milliseconds, so you're talking about two orders of magnitude difference in speed. Um, and so when you're talking about a CLI application, just having that responsiveness and being able to run commands is something that's noticeable for the end user. Um, and since then, we've done a bunch of stuff to kind of optimize and, and make that better uh, today, but uh, that it was kind of you know, a wake-up call a little bit. And one of the biggest culprits for this is that required in Ruby is not known to be a fast thing. So when you're loading files at runtime, Ruby has to actually check the load path and then find the file. So as you add more things onto the load path, it becomes um, slower and slower to actually do this. And you can imagine if you, as you start building out a complex command line application like your Rails app, there starts to be more and more files as you refactor it and make it cleaner so you don't just have this like one large file that's like 2,000 lines of Ruby code. Um, but that meant that we would have a somewhat of a performance hit for having to break apart our application. 
Um, so it kind of sucks that, to have to make that trade off um, and decide like, how should I do this? How should I organize my app for both speed and for maintainability? Um, one of the other really great things about Go at the time uh, is that it can actually make a statically linked um, binary that you can distribute. So you would have a single file that you could then package up and give to someone. Um, and unlike a Ruby application like you have with Rails and other things, when you deploy it, you have a directory of a bunch of different files that all have to be there in the right order and then kind of pushed up when you deploy. So our Heroku gem, you know, like when it gets unpacked, it's not a single file, it's a bunch of files on your disk locally. Um, and when I mean statically linked, I mean there are no other dependencies uh, on that binary that you have to install to get it working. Um, so you, there's no like bundle install or other setup, like you can just give someone this single file and they run it and it just works. Um, and then we could do this for all the major operating systems we want to support. In our case, that's Linux, Mac, and Windows. So having a binary that's native for each of those platforms allows it to be much easier to actually distribute this um, and share it with our customers. And Heroku wasn't the only one who kind of started going through this process. Uh, if you have, there's various things in the Ruby community like Vagrant, which is an operations tool for uh, setting up images and things. Uh, it started off as a Ruby gem, so if you go to rubygems.org and you search for Vagrant, you can find it, and I think the last release was sometime in 2014. But then they stopped doing the gems and they started going along the same path and packaging up a runtime, and now they're completely a Go CLI. So again, they've gone through a similar path of, you know, it was easy to start in Ruby, but now you're seeing them move away because of uh, some of the problems that I listed. And it kind of becomes painful as your user base moves beyond just Ruby customers uh, as you're building command line applications. There are some options out there. Uh, one of the ones I found was Traveling Ruby, and uh, they basically allow you to package up your Ruby application. It doesn't compile it down to a single binary, but you can package it up as a single like tarball or package, and uh, it will bun you can bundle in a pre-compiled Ruby binary that they pre-compile for you, so you don't have to do that work uh, yourself for doing Windows or uh, Linux or OS X, depending on what your operating system is not. And then it, can, it will come with the application. You can make a platform-specific one for each of the operating systems, which is nice. Um, and then they also have a set of native gems, like Nokugiri and other things that you would commonly want to use. The downfall here is that it is not a single binary at the end of the day. Um, it is still a Ruby application that is unpacked. Um, and then you're kind of limited to the stuff that they pre-compile unless, kind of unless you want to do that work yourself. So a great solution if you don't want to rewrite your app and you kind of fit the stuff that they've already built for you. Um, but the moment you do want to extend beyond like that specific version of Nokugiri or gems that they don't have, uh, then it does become a lot harder. So uh, you do lose a lot of flexibility by choosing something like this. Um, and I went, when I was in Portugal last year, I ran to Eric and uh, we were talking about this problem and uh, nowadays he's actually building stuff in Crystal uh, for kind of handling these kind of tests and looking into it. So uh, besides Go, um, there's also other languages that are kind of entrenching in the space that allow you to exactly compile binaries that can be distributed. So kind of after searching the field and, and looking at this problem from a bit of a far away uh, for the last few years, uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that there wasn't really a great packaging story inside of MRI itself. And that was a little disappointing to me because I was seeing lots of projects that started in Ruby move away from it. And um, we're at a Ruby conference and I'm sure the reason you're here is because, like me, you enjoy building things in Ruby. And there's you know, something really special about being in this community and the people. I've been here for probably like six years fairly actively in the Ruby community. And I've gotten a ton of uh, stuff from this community. And I, I still want to be here when I'm building the tools that I need to get my job done. And I don't want that to be the roadblock of why I can't get my job done, but still do the things that I uh, love in the language that I want to use it in. So, we want, I set out to try to make packaging possible while still running things in Ruby. And we started this project, uh, Zachary Scott and I, uh, called MRuby CLI. And uh, it's here on this GitHub repo, own slash MRuby CLI. 
And we really had a few design goals in mind. So at the end of the day, like I was saying, I really enjoy writing things in Ruby, so that means if you're building a CLI application using MRuby CLI, you should be writing Ruby for the most part. Um, and so here is the directory structure of the MRuby CLI app, which is in and of itself an MRuby CLI application. Um, and so as you can see, there's a bunch of RB files because the majority of the code, probably like 90% of it, is written in Ruby itself. And that means it's that all the syntax and things that you're familiar with are what you're writing in every day, um, which is really awesome. And then, you know, it supports subdirectories and other things to kind of how you can organize wrap the way you want to. Uh, so things familiar to Rubyus. Um, and the next thing is performance as a feature. And, you know, I found that out uh, just like being at Heroku that having a CLI that takes a long time to start up is a huge thing. And so specifically, uh, runtime performance is obviously important, but I think especially for CLI applications, boot time and, run and startup performance is even more important uh, for running, especially like quick commands, um, but even for some long running commands. So to, to kind of uh, showcase this, uh, most of the times I, I take like hello world applications as, with a grain of salt of like how they indicate performance, but uh, I think inside of uh, this particular application makes a lot of sense because it shows the boot up time and like how fast it is it takes to boot up and exit your application. So I'm sure all of us have written this application at some point um, in our life in, in MRI, and on my machine, which admittedly is a kind of old laptop, it would take about 41 milliseconds to just print hello world to the screen. Um, so that's not super slow and that's totally bearable and like you can make a performant application that people will not like yell at you about. Um, but when we're to do this with MRuby CLI and the tool that we built, uh, we got it down to three milliseconds. So just the base like boot up time is an order of magnitude faster, which for us was really impressive. And it makes it, it gives you a lot more headroom to do stuff in the runtime. Um, so that was a, one of the big goals. And I think one of the huge contributing factors to that is that in MRuby there is no require. The stuff, all your Ruby files get stackedly compiled in and are available at runtime or in memory. Uh, so you can just like call it out and not have to load those files while you're running the application. Um, and the like Go, I think one, a huge thing for actually making distribu distribution easy, unlike Rails apps where you can have these advanced Capistrano scripts and stuff, when I'm installing something on a machine I don't control, like a customer or users, I want to have a single file that I can give them for every major platform that they can use that is easy to just like take and run on your machine with no extra setup uh, necessary. And so one of the big goals for us was to be able to, from a single machine, cross-compile to other major operating systems. So out of the box for the core library, we've been able to cross-compile to 64-bit uh, Linux, 64-bit uh, Apple, 64-bit Windows, as well as the 32-bit version. So depending on what your customer's using, you can compile binaries for them to use. And to give you a sense of how big these files are, on OS X, when we just checked the file size on the file system, it was only 421K. So not the smallest, but like when you're packaging a whole runtime and VM in there, that's pretty tiny, um, especially uh, compared to packaging up things in Ruby. And the next thing is like we don't, to be able to do all that stuff and a lot of things, you have to set up a lot of tooling to actually get the cross-compiling tool chains and stuff working. We want to make that as simple as possible. So we're using Docker um, to kind of use Linux as a base to then cross-compile to all the other operating systems. So uh, we have a Docker image, uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Docker, it's not the most important part of this talk, but it basically allows us to ship a fully contained development environment that has all the tools and things you need, and then you can not have to worry about doing the setup to actually use MRuby CLI besides getting Docker installed. Um, and so the hello world for us of actually generating this is when you have MRuby CLI on your path, you run MRuby CLI setup hello, and it, uh, you, it generates a file directory like in Rails, and you run a compile task that uh, we give you, and then uh, you can boot into the container, and then when you run the command, uh, you see the hello world. And so that's kind of the hello world in the few steps uh, that you can do it in with MRuby CLI. And to kind of get a sense of how this all works, we should look at all the files that are actually generated when you run setup. Um, so we'll go through most of these to give you a sense of what it's like to actually develop in this and, and what these things that are actually being generated. Um, and kind of before we get there, uh, we need to take a step back and look at like MRuby itself, like the technology that we're building all this on. Um, so what is MRuby and like how is it different from Ruby itself? Uh, 
And so mRuby was built to be a much lighter weight implementation of Ruby, uh, and it's targeted to be embedded in other programming languages. Uh, so it would be used oftentimes, uh, like in Andrew's example, of just like having Arduinos and stuff. Uh, on Arduino Uno, you can actually compile mRuby and have it running like native on the actual hardware. Um, so it's meant to be like tiny and lightweight to be used on smaller devices. Um, and that helps a lot with the boot up time in, in the design that we'll see. Um, so target, uh, or comp competing languages here is mainly like stuff like Lua, which is used oftentimes in like game scripting and, and embedding and other languages in themselves to kind of do smaller lightweight things. Um, and it's not just like, it's not just a toy language. In Japan, they're actually using it in production and things. And one of the use cases I found uh, publicly that was interesting was that people were using mRuby inside of the OpenWT firmware for routers to basically be able to allow you to build plugins and extensions to OpenWRT without having to kind of build all that stuff that you would to actually build the firmware, which is cool. Um, and here are pictures of some contributors. So it was created by Matt's uh, a few years ago. He talked about it at RubyConf. Um, but uh, so it's a language that is designed by Matt's. So if you're looking for a lightweight Ruby implementation, that's not, it's great that Matt's actually wrote it. Um, and so let's kind of dig into what the differences are with MRI itself. Um, so since it's meant to be built and run on a bunch of different architectures, there's no kind of built-in operating system level libraries into the core itself. If you want any of that thing, any of those things, you have to pull those things in separately. So the core is supposed to be really lightweight and small. So you don't have file, socket IO, uh, it's not thread safe, there's no threading or forking, like things that are very operating system specific. Um, and the syntax itself is a subset of Ruby 2.1. So uh, the syntax and commands that you're used to in Ruby 2.1 um, are there, uh, with the exception of things like keyword arguments, which aren't implemented. But I think we just got string freeze actually recently, so that's kind of cool. Um, but kind of the core things that are used to in Ruby itself, like procs, blocks, uh, all the monkey patching you want to do, uh, eval, metaprobing literals, are all like in the language itself. So it is Ruby at its core, um, it's not, even though it's a lighter weight implementation of it. And to get a sense of how we made all this possible, we have to look at how you actually execute MRuby code. So similar to MRI, like you can actually just write a file called foo.rb, hello.rb, and actually just execute it um, with the interpreter that's compiled. So uh, you can just write a script, and maybe if you're building some plugin system, this would make sense, because then people could do stuff uh, dynamically at runtime without having to pre-compile everything. So that's cool. Uh, IRB, uh, definitely one of the things that really attracted me to Ruby in the early days. It was really exciting to see this uh, coming from Java where this was not a thing at the time. Um, but being able to boot up into MIRB and kind of play around and have that live feedback is a thing that you can do that's built into the core language. Um, and this is where it starts to get interesting is that there's actually a bytecode compiler inside of MRuby itself. So you can take any .rb file that is written for MRuby and run it through the bytecode compiler and it generates this .mrb file, uh, which we then can run through the interpreter uh, using a flag to actually run the code. So in here we see we bytecode compiled hello world, and then we execute that uh, bytecode, and we get the results. Um, so this allows us to, at runtime, skip doing all the parsing and stuff that you have to do normally in MRI uh, when you load any files. Uh, so that's great for improving startup performance. Um, and if we take this even further, uh, you can actually embed the bytecode inside of a C file. So you can have the bytecode compiler actually build C uh, bytecode, or bytecode in C as represented as an array, and then use that to compile it in the language, or inside of C. And uh, then you can write basically a short wrapper C file that then executes that mRuby code. Um, if that went over your head, uh, don't worry about it. You don't have to touch any of that stuff uh, inside of uh, mRuby CLI itself. Um, but it kind of just goes and explains how this works. So inside of mRuby CLI, we actually generate a wrapper C code, so you never actually, if you don't want to, touch any C files. We, we embed the mRuby bytecode stuff uh, for you and, and handle all that work um, so you don't have to. Um, and the only contract we have there is that we need a way in C to kind of execute the mRuby code that you're writing. So the only interface we have is that inside of, somewhere inside of that MRB lib folder where all your Ruby code lives, you have to have this function, this underscore main underscore underscore. And it takes argv, which are the arguments that get passed to 
your command line, and then you can do what you want with it. So you can ignore it, just print hello world, or you can do probably like some insane stuff there. Um, and like I was saying, uh, in mruby lib, this is where all your Ruby code lives. Uh, one of the cool things about mruby is that it's all built on top of uh, Ruby, the whole build system. So uh, actually playing around with the build system is all on top of Rake, and it uses MRI itself to actually build it. Um, there is a build config for you to actually configure how your builds work. So we generate this file for you so you don't have to touch it. So there's a host build that's kind of the core build that has debugging and other support. So when you're actually running tests and things, you can actually see the stack trace. But when you're shipping stuff in production, you probably actually want to strip those things. So when we build the production versions of all your builds, like that stuff is not included. Um, and then there's basically a cross build for every platform that we're supporting and all that stuff is generated for you. And then, as you can see, when you actually build it, you get the binary hello, and you have one of these summaries for every platform that gets built. Um, there's the M or Rake, which is equivalent to like your Ruby gem specification, basically. Uh, and in here, you specify all the metadata stuff that you would in Ruby gems, but also your dependencies. And the way it works in MRuby is that there's, uh, you use this add dependency, and it takes two arguments, which is the name of the Ruby gem as well as where it comes from. So in core, there's a set of core libraries that aren't necessarily bundled in by default, but are available as part of MRuby itself that you don't have to hit the internet to get. And so there's a bunch of stuff like extending array to get more methods, for instance, that you would want that are used to an MRI, but by default they're not built in to keep it as small as possible. And inside that folder you can find um, all the gems that are built in. Um, you can, there's this thing called mgem, which is like rubygems.org, but way more ghetto, because it's actually just a, repository on GitHub that has a file of every gem and like where you get it from. And so from there, from that list, you can specify to not have to know the GitHub repo of where it is. And then, um, so here's a list of all the M gems uh, that are available, or here's what it looks like. Um, and then finally, um, you can use GitHub. So like in Bundler, uh, if you just want to build your own MRB gem or just fork someone's MRB gem and use that, uh, as you make modifications, as you're building stuff, you can just reference a GitHub repo. Um, and one of the great things is that it's actually really easy, unlike in Bundler, uh, when you have like say, you need to fix some um, dependency of one of your dependencies, uh, like maybe there's a bug that you need to fix that isn't pushed up or released, you can actually, in your build config, override anything to then take precedence over that. So you could specify, for instance, say, I had a, someone dependent on MRuby YAML and I wanted to override it with my version because I'm using specific features there. Uh, I can specify that without having to change my MRuby gem.rake and kind of have to go all the way down to do that. Um, and of course, uh, since we're Rubyists, we like to do testing. So uh, one of the things that comes out of the box is this thing called mTest, which allows us to write unit tests inside of mRuby itself. So these, this is mRuby code, uh, and it gets executed, and it builds basically a mTest binary that has all your unit tests and gets run. So uh, there's a set of assertions that are available that we can use, and it's highly based off of test unit. Um, and so when we run it, we see output like this. Um, there's also bin tests, which is built using MRI and it allows us to do integration testing. So that allows us to get access to all of MRI's actual libraries and things. So potentially you could even use like RSpec or something or any other libraries that we wanted um, to then run the binary itself and kind of check the output and things there. Um, so that's great. We can do both unit testing and integration tests. Um, so what are the gotchas that we have? Like why shouldn't we all just jump on board and, and use this? So one of the first ones is there's no standard lib like an MRI, like we don't have access to a lot of the stuff that's available out there. And if you do want it, then you have to either find an M or B gem that is either built into core or in an M gem or build it yourself uh, to actually use it. So there's a huge swath of stuff missing, which means it's actually really hard to just port a straight Ruby gem to M Ruby because a lot of stuff, even if they don't have any dependencies, probably leverage tons of the standard library. So it's I've definitely tried with a bunch of stuff, and some have been successful and have not been, but it's generally a non-trivial task to then port a lot of stuff from Ruby gems to MRB gems. But on the plus side, that means we don't have to live with the baggage and things that were issues with MRI that we don't like, uh, which is kind of cool. There's a chance to kind of revamp that whole system. And as we're trying to build out this cross-platform system and ecosystem, 
Uh, that means for these MRB gems that depend on C and other things, we actually have to build out the native uh, extension support for cross-compiling. So as I'm touching various MRB gems and using them to build things actually used at work and stuff, I am going through and making sure they work on Windows and OS X and Linux, uh, but that's still like a very manual process for me. But I'm hoping that as we go through this, like there's just gonna be a huge assortment of these MRB gems where it's not something the standard person has to think about. Uh, one of the projects that I, uh, was, is really cool is that uh, there's this thing called JRuby Launcher, if you ever use JRuby, and it's, uh, normally with JRuby, you, they maintain this, these bash and bat files that are uh, used to boot up JRuby. Um, because the JVM is not known to be very fast at booting things up, so you can't write it in Java. Um, but it's kind of a pain to maintain these like two files, like a special thing for Windows and, and other stuff for every other Unix system. Uh, so they wrote this thing in C++ called JRuby Launcher where they stole the majority of the code, or borrowed, I guess, from NetBeans and from 1996. So as you can see here, there's like some really old commit logs from like six years ago, I think. Um, and so I just pulled up like the JRuby CPP file and you, there's like this awesome like 1997 to 2008 copyright. Like this company's not even around anymore. Like I, Oracle bought them. Um, but yeah, it's kind of scary that this file hasn't even been touched for like six whole years. And after talking with Charlie and Tom, they said they, if possible, they don't touch this when they don't have to. And I don't like doing string and option parsing in C++. So a coworker of mine actually using MRuby CLI has built uh, this new Ruby JRuby launcher on top of MRuby CLI to basically replace all that C++ code. So there's some C code that interacts with uh, the JVM, but the core of the option parts and everything is built on top of Ruby. And so what's awesome is he has unit tests that are built into Ruby, um, and then also integration tests as well. So what does this all mean for you? Uh, so MRuby as a whole is very young compared to uh, Ruby itself, like Ruby just passed its 20th birthday recently, and I think MRuby is only maybe like six years old or something. I might, I'm probably off on that. Um, and Matt's is actually very active, and it's on GitHub. We use GitHub issues, so if you send a pull request, uh, Matt's actually looks at them and comments on them, and they do get merged. Like I've gotten three or four commits merged, and I've gotten commit bit to the project. Uh, and it's really great if you want a chance to kind of interact with Matt's and stuff, uh, more closely, which has been a really great experience for me. Um, and since it's new, uh, there's a lot of really low-hanging fruit to be done. And in preparation for Rocky Mountain Ruby, I've released the latest stuff that we've had on Master for MRuby CLI. So we have version 0.03, and as you can tell, it's a fairly new project. Um, and so you can go, uh, if you go to the GitHub repo under the releases tag, you can download a binary that's specific to your operating system that works and runs, and you can put it anywhere on your path or anywhere on your file system and just like, as long as it's in your path, you can run it. Um, so go download the binary, uh, set up the Docker toolbox, which is what is recommended for OS X and Windows. If you're using Linux, then you have to install Docker and Docker Compose by hand. Um, and then uh, go and build like a simple application. Like, I think it's pretty simple uh, to get started. So like when I was in school, like a common thing was like, build a calculator, like add some numbers together and, and start to slowly add functionality. Um, and then modify it, compile it, and, and kind of get it working and running to get a feel of it. And then definitely like, let me know what you're doing. Uh, it's a young project, so we're always supportive and excited about uh, people actually building and working on things in it. Um, so yeah, uh, let's go build some things in Ruby. Like I'm very excited to be able to hopefully help bring people back into the community that have thought of leaving um, and um, yeah, I love Ruby in this community and I'd love to see more people involved in trying to help get us more on the roadmap of other projects and companies. So thank you, uh, I, this is my blue hat sticker and if you would like one, I do have some with me. So come talk to me, say hi, uh, thanks. I don't think we have time for questions.